I'm so honored to be part of this event, celebrating the inauguration of Dr. Cholas as ACOG president. I'm also grateful for the opportunity to provide an update on COVID-19. I'd like to share some of what we've learned so rapidly over the last few months and think a bit about where we go from here. I have no financial disclosures. Coronavirus disease 2019, or COVID-19, is caused by a novel coronavirus. SARS-CoV-2 is closely related to the coronavirus that causes SARS, the viral respiratory disease that was identified in 2003. COVID-19 has rapidly spread throughout the world, leading the World Health Organization to declare a pandemic on March 11th. For the next two slides, I'm going to show the Johns Hopkins dashboard. It was created and is maintained by a small team at Hopkins. During this pandemic, it has emerged as an authoritative source for up-to-date information about the pandemic. The information comes from a variety of sources, including the CDC, WHO, health departments, and media reports. You can see in the upper left-hand corner that there are more than 2 million COVID-confirmed cases globally. In the upper right-hand corner, you can see that there are more than 150,000 deaths globally. The largest number of cases is in the United States, with nearly 700,000 cases and more than 30,000 deaths. Transmission of SARS-CoV-2 appears to be primarily through respiratory droplets, although other modes of transmission, such as fomates and aerosols, are also possible. Transmission from asymptomatic persons has also been well documented, although how often this occurs is not well understood. Manifestations of COVID-19 most frequently observed include fever, cough, myalgia, fatigue, and shortness of breath. Other less commonly reported symptoms include sore throat, headache, cough, hemoptysis, diarrhea, nausea, and loss of taste and smell. In terms of gender differences, there are more cases among men than women. The case fatality rate also seems to be higher in men than women. The case fatality rate increases with age. Children have been infrequently diagnosed as having COVID-19, and when infected, they appear to be mildly affected or without symptoms. In addition to age, risk factors also include hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, chronic respiratory disease, and cancer. Bilateral pneumonia is often observed on radiographic imaging, and the most common laboratory finding is lymphopenia. Although there is a lot of information rapidly emerging from this pandemic, there's still a lot we need to learn about COVID-19's effect in pregnancy. There's no evidence that pregnant women are more susceptible to COVID-19. However, it's important to understand that there are no data to carefully assess this. Based on what we know so far, pregnant women do not seem to be at an increased risk for severe disease compared to the general population. This comes from some limited data from China, as well as accumulating data from experience in the United States. Hospitals in New York City are beginning to share their experiences and are publishing helpful information. One of many unanswered questions that is emerging from the US experience is whether there's an increased risk of postpartum decompensation in COVID-19 patients. We urgently need US data that compare pregnant women with COVID-19 to age-matched non-pregnant controls. This will help us understand whether or not pregnancy is a risk factor for a severe disease. I think one of our best opportunities to get these data quickly on a nationwide scale is from priority. Priority is a nationwide registry that is collecting and rapidly disseminating this information. There's currently no evidence of increased pregnancy loss or birth defects associated with COVID-19 infections. However, it's important to note that most of the information reported thus far has been about infections in the latter half of pregnancy. 
Some infants born to mother with, mothers with COVID-19 were born preterm and of low birth weight. However, it's hard to know if this is related to COVID-19. Based on the experience with previous infections, including influenza, adverse effects on the fetus or infant can occur even in the absence of intrauterine transmission. For example, fevers in the first trimester of pregnancy have been known to increase the risk for certain birth defects, such as neural tube defects. Severe maternal illness requiring admission to an intensive care unit has been associated with increased risk for preterm birth, low birth weight, and low APGAR scores. Although there have been reports of infants with COVID-19 infection shortly after birth, it's unclear whether these infections occurred before or shortly after birth. Whether transmission can occur through breastfeeding is also unknown. Some small studies have tested breast milk from infected mothers for the virus. Although these studies have had negative results, they were too small to be conclusive. In recent weeks, the role of asymptomatic shedding in COVID-19 has been highlighted. In a recent report from New York City, 13% of 215 women presenting for delivery were found to be COVID positive and asymptomatic. This suggests that COVID-19 testing on labor and delivery may be helpful. As we all know, despite this devastating pandemic, the babies keep coming. As our busy labor and delivery units continue to function at full capacity, there's been anxiety and concern about how we best protect ourselves and our patients. Specifically, there's been a lot of confusion around personal protective equipment, or PPE. I've been referring to this as massive mask confusion. There's also been a lot of concern about whether the second stage of labor is an aerosolizing procedure. Given what we know to date, the primary mode of transmission for COVID-19 is through respiratory droplets. This is good news. This means that the bundle of recommended PPE, including N95 respirator or face mask, plus eye protection, gown, and gloves, have been shown to be very effective for reducing the risk of viral respiratory infections. The key for us as obstetricians is to be familiar with whatever PPE is stocked on our labor and delivery units, to train and retrain with that PPE, including correct donning and doffing procedures, and to use PPE correctly and consistently. Correct and consistent use of PPE, combined with strict adherence to hand hygiene and careful environmental cleaning, will help keep us healthy during this time of COVID-19. I remember the H1N1 influenza pandemic in 2009 and 2010. Although it's been more than a decade, it seems like just yesterday. Following that pandemic, once we had a safe and effective vaccine, I remember feeling so relieved. I also remember feeling encouraged that we had learned so much. The scope and breadth of this pandemic is so much greater. It touches every aspect of our lives. It is not confined to our role as obstetrician gynecologists. It affects our roles as partners, and parents, and community members, and employers, and on and on. But I am encouraged to see that informal networks are forming across the nation to share best practices. We are innovating as we go along. We are implementing new approaches in short order. We are rapidly implementing and expanding the role of telehealth in our practices. We are expanding the role of rapid testing on labor and delivery. We are reminded about the importance of PPE in our practices. We have a renewed and reinvigorated focus on physician wellness. Many of these changes in practice and innovations will survive long after COVID-19. I'm frequently hearing people ask, when will this be over? I believe that this will be over when there is a safe, effective, and widely available vaccine. Until then, please stay safe. Our patients, our families, and our communities need us. Thank you.